Hello, this is a video. Uh, this is going to deal with a relatively short topic, and it's called uh, blocking of experiments with a single factor. And I'll explain blocking in a moment, and later in the course we'll return to this topic when we're dealing with factorial experiments with multiple factors. And I just want to explain the idea of blocking, and it's relatively simple. Um, but easy to do in practice. And the idea is that sometimes in doing an experiment, you have nuisance sources of variation. That is, there are things in the environment that could influence the response, but they're not of interest to you. They're not part of your experimental strategy. Yet, if you don't somehow control their effect on your response, then the uh, nuisance variation may become confounded or even mask the effects of the uh, factor or factors that you're trying to experiment with. And up until now in the course, all the experiments we've talked about, we've restricted ourselves to one factor experiments, but all the trials are done in a completely random order. Well, when we have important nuisance variations, sometimes we restrict the variation as a form of control. And one of the ways we restrict variation is the one we're going to uh, talk about today is through what we call the idea of blocking. And I'm going to come back to this later in the course and talk about something called split plots, but that's later, so I'm going to skip that topic for now. But again, blocking simply means you take all of your experimental trials and you do them in blocks, literally. And the idea is that within a block, all of the experimental units are more or less homogeneous. Between the blocks, they may be systematically different. So the idea of doing the uh, set of trials in blocks is that in doing so, any differences between the blocks uh, of trials that you've done can be removed. In fact, Fisher himself first used the term blocking, and what he meant by blocking was literally a blocking filter. That was exactly his idea. So we're going to take the filter, apply it to the experiment, and do in such a way that all this nuisance variation is easily removed. For now, we're going to talk about the case where we do, within each block of trials, we do every single treatment condition. Later in the course, we'll talk about scenarios where there are too many different types of treatments to be run that they couldn't be do, done in all blocks, and we call those incomplete block designs. The key is, in each block, I have a complete set of trials, and the order in which I do the trials in each block is randomized. So block one, block two, block three would have a different run order. However, I can't really randomize the blocks. They're usually determined uh, by the nature of the variation, and I'll explain that with a couple of examples in a moment. And another key point, is, and this is a big one, the nuisance variation is really not of interest. In other words, it, it truly is a nuisance to your experiment, and you just want a way to remove its effect. So you can see if the factors you're really interested in are having an effect. Okay. So again, this goes back to R.A. Fisher and in the 1920s, and what he discovered, and is basically true, that when you do field trials in agriculture, the fields are in no way uniform. In fact, there are typically very big differences between sections of the field. And those differences are typically known to the scientist. They've often fully characterized the fields. The difference is, in Fisher's experiments, OK, we know there's a moisture gradient. We know there's a fertility gradient, uh, different soil conditions, and so forth. But we're not interested in studying that. We want to st study something like fertilizer or irrigation or seed type. 
So we're going to do our experimental trials in a set of blocks. Within a block, the growing conditions are more or less homogeneous. Between the blocks, they may be different. So if you think of each block as a set of experimental units, within the block, they're more or less uniform. Between the blocks, they can be very different. The key is when you have these nuisance sources of variation and you want to control them, and you usually do, then you need to think about this before you run the experiment and set up the blocking scheme. Okay. And it's pretty straightforward. Basically, I've got some number of treatments, experimental conditions. I want each block to have a complete set of treatments. So it turns out that when you run multiple blocks, those actually form the replicates. And we're going to show in a moment, it's actually easy to remove systematic differences between the blocks. In other words, we can adjust for them. So the differences between the blocks are removed. So when, once we do that, then as I said, the complete set of, say, B blocks forms a set of replicates. Again, the blocks are typically not randomized. It's usually not even possible to randomize them. But the run order within each block is randomized. An important point at the bottom of the slide, this is actually very important. You must assume the blocking factor cannot interact with the experimental factor. In fact, we actually don't even have a way to test for such an interaction. So in our analyses, what you're going to see is that we will always assume the blocks and the treatments are completely independent. There is no relationship between them. Okay. So I'm going to skip through the next uh, set of slides. You can take a look at them. Um, in fact, on slide 8, I'll just mention that sometimes we run what are called incomplete blocks. I talk a little bit about it later in the course. And in design of experiments, too, we typically spend quite a bit of time on what are called incomplete block designs. But that's not, a, not our concern in the present discussion. Okay. So to illustrate blocking, and I think you'll see from this discussion how simple the idea is, we're going to look at an experiment from agriculture. So this is an experiment studying wheat yields. And the experimental factor is nitrogen application. And they're looking at six different ways to apply a nitrogen source to the field. And the way the experiment is set up, in the field where they're going to experiment, there's a moisture gradient. In other words, moisture is going to have an impact on the uh, growth of the wheat. And they know because of how they apply irrigation, some parts of the field are, have a higher moisture content than others. They're not interested in studying moisture at this point. They're interested in studying nitrogen regiments. So what they did, they took their field, where they're going to do the trials, and they broke it into four blocks. Within each block, they randomly assign the six nitrogen re regimens in some random order. Okay. And within the block, they assume the growing conditions are the same. Between the blocks, they actually know the growing conditions are not the same. So each trial has a different moisture level, each block, I should say. But within the block, the conditions are considered homogeneous. So slide 10 gives you an idea of what a block design looks like. So notice they have four blocks. And within each block, there's a complete set of treatments okay, in random order. So each block is a replicate. So this experiment has four replicates. Each block is a set of replicates. And what we want to do is to find out if there are differences between the nitrogen regimens. And to do that, we need to remove or adjust the response for the blocking effect. 
So I'm going to, at this point, go over to jump and we'll take a look at the experiment. Very easy to analyze these uh, blocking designs. So first I'm going to show you how to do it in the fit model platform and then I'll show you how to do it in fit y by x. Okay, so go to analyze to fit model and there are two factors that can go in the model, the blocking factor and then the treatment variable. The treatment variable is the experimental factor. The block represents the nuisance variation we want to remove from uh, the response so we can see if the treatments matter. And our response is stem tissue nitrate concentration in part per million. Okay. So notice I do not add an interaction of block and treatment. They are independent. So we run the design. Notice in the ANOVA table we have an error term. That error term is comprised of the blocking variation. Okay. So we've removed the blocking variation. We're going to separate it out. Plus on top of the blocking variation there's an additional experimental error. So notice there is a really big treatment effect. In other words, it appears highly significant. Notice, if you look at the sum of squares for blocking, that indicates there's a lot of variation between the blocks. But again, it's not of interest. Also, uh, I'll point out, um, in terms of these, this test of significance on a block, I'm going to show this later on. This test is incorrect and should be ignored. Okay. So we can, can look at the F test for the treatment effect, ignore it from the block. In fact, you can just look at the magnitude of the sum of squares for block to see that, yes, there is a significant effect of the uh, blocks. In other words, there really are differences in growing conditions between the blocks. Again, it's nuisance variation. We're not interested. If I have one experimental factor, the best place to analyze a complete block design is in fit y by x. Okay, so we've used fit y by x before for ANOVA. We're going to do the same here. The response again is nitrate concentration. Notice you're given a window or a box to declare a blocking factor. So I'm going to put block in there. That's because in one factor experiments, blocking factors are very common. Again, treatment is the experimental factor. Block is simply that, the blocking or filtering factor, and we're not interested in studying block. We're interested in just getting rid of the variation caused by the differences between the blocks. Okay, so we click OK, and then notice when we come into the report window. Notice what it says. It says block centered measurements. So in this scatter plot, the, the differences between the blocks has already been removed by jump. And what it's doing is pretty simple. In each block, an average is calculated, an average for each block, and then that average is subtracted from each measurement in the block. That, that gives each block an average of zero because there are variations about the average. So we could do an analysis just with these plus or minus deviations, but that's not very intuitive. So what jump does, it adds the grand average back on to the block uh, centered values and gives you a more intuitive scale. So the block variation is now removed. So we can now do ANOVA. So I'm just going to click on the report menu, do an ANOVA. We've already had a little practice with ANOVA. Scroll down. Okay. 
there's my treatment effect. Okay, sum of squares, the block sum of squares, and the error. Again, do not pay attention to that significance test on block. Okay. And if you look at the means report down below, you can see there does appear to be a lot of variation between uh, the blocks in terms of the overall uh, effects. Now, look at the block means. So for block one, it would take the six measurements and subtract 38. For block two, okay, it would take all the six measurements in block two and subtract 45.89 and so forth. So these give you differences. Then they would ju jump just adds back on the overall grand average and that's what you get in the plot. Okay. So it does appear that there are significant differences between the different treatments. Okay. Of course, in ANOVA, we don't really know, um, based on the ANOVA, which treatments are different. So we have to do multiple comparisons, and we can do them here. Now that we've removed the block variation, I could go ahead and go to compare means, and I could do things like two keys, all possible two sample t-tests. Okay, and you can see if I click on uh, what's the highest C, that C is not really different from B and F uh, and so forth. And again, if you scroll down, as we've shown uh, before in the course, you can take a look at the connecting letters graph. Okay. Now, probably in this type of ex an experiment, you'd be more interested in what has the highest yield. So that would lead you to choose multiple comparison with best. Okay. So I'm going to go back to compare means, and I'm going to select shoes method. Okay. So if we look down below, we look for the shoe report. And we want a best, so we look at the column that says max. And we notice that three of the treatments, C, B, and F, would be considered best. In other words, we cannot really tell C, B, and F apart. So we would say uh, those three seem to give us the highest yields. At that point, it would be up to subject matter experts to decide if they wanted to pick one of the three. Okay. And by the way, they're in order, so overall, uh, C had the highest, B second highest, and F the third highest. Okay. In fact, you can see that uh, up above in the connecting letters report. So Shoes method said these are the three best, so maybe you pick C, or maybe you take a cost consideration and pick one of the others. But C, B, and F would be basically the winners in terms of maximum yield. And then notice there is a control group. Okay. And the control group, if you wanted to, since there is a control, we could actually do under compare means Dunnett's method. Okay. So looking at Dunnett's method, remember comparisons are only made back to the control. Okay. So if we take a look, we see that C and B and possibly F are different from the control. Okay. So this just reinforces that C, B, and F seem to be the winners in this experiment. But remember, we have six uh, factors in the experiment. So there are 15 comparisons in, in the uh, student's T report. You can see all 15. That means the overall false discovery rate could be fairly high. So one last approach we could use if we were really more concerned with finding false differences is to go ahead and use compare means and do the Tukey test. Okay. And let's scroll down and see what, remember, uh, Tukey's is the least powerful. It finds the least 
number of true differences, but it makes the smallest number of uh, other differences. So notice with Tukey's method, there's really not much separation uh, between these. So C, B, F, and D are alike, and B, F, D, E, and the control are alike. So you'll have to make a trade-off. Um, again, I don't like to use two keys unless I have a very large number of comparisons because the tests have low power, meaning they, they may not make a lot of false discoveries, but they miss a lot of real differences. In fact, given we're looking for a best, I would actually have picked Shoe's method because Shoe's method is almost as powerful as the student T procedure but doesn't make as many uh, false discoveries. In terms of power, students T, the all, do all possible two sample T test is the most powerful. It makes the most errors. The two key test has the least power to find real differences, but makes the smallest number of false discoveries. So for me, given I know I'm looking for a best, I would go with Shoe's approach. Okay, so that is an analysis. I'm going to go back to the notes briefly. These, the notes are not very long. This is a pretty straightforward topic. And we've looked at the wheat yield experiment in depth. Uh, just take a look on slide 16, and that explains uh, what I was describing to you about the idea of block-centered differences. That is, how do we adjust for block-to-block -block variation? It's actually very straightforward. And you can take a look at the slide. It reiterates what I mentioned to you earlier. And I'm going to skip through some of this and get to one last topic. When you put a blocking factor in your, into your design, it typically can take up a lot of degrees of freedom. In other words, to estimate the block effect can take up a lot of the observations in the experiment. So if the blocking factor really does not contribute significant variation to the response, in our analysis, we'd rather remove it. And I'm going to go back to jump and show this in a moment. But as I mentioned to you, the overall F test for block is incorrect. The reason for it is, there is the differences between blocks are systematic. There is no experimental error. So the F test usually compares the treatment effect to the experimental error, which is noise. But we don't have experimental error in the noise, so the, the F test or the ratio, the F ratio makes no sense. Here's a simple rule as to whether or not you should remove the block factor. If the F test is less than 1, it's really that simple. If the F test is less than 1, remove the block factor. And what that actually tells you is if the F test is less than 1, if you remove the blocking factor from the model, the estimated effects will actually be more precise. They'll have smaller standard errors. So if the blocking factor is 1 or greater, that means the blocking factor contributes significant variation. And if I were to take the blocking factor out, the variances of the estimated effects would go up possibly a great deal, and I wouldn't really be able to tell if there are differences. Okay, so I'm going to go back to jump, and we'll use this wheat yield experiment. So I'm going to leave that analysis open that we've already looked at. And I'm going to do another analysis, but this time I'm going to take block out of the model. So let's assume that there was no blocking and they just randomly assign the treatments all over the field without regard to the moisture gradient. And the way I can simulate that, just remove the blocking factor. Okay. So here is the analysis about to happen. Notice 
the response is no longer block centered so the variation you can actually even if I can bring this down a little bit you can even see it if you look at the two scales of measurement that the observations on the right without the block in the model have greater variation I can go ahead and do ANOVA okay. and notice in the original analysis with the blocking factor the treatment effect was highly significant very small p-value once I take the block out of the model the p-value actually goes above 0.05 why is that? Well notice in the design without the blocking factor look at the size of the experimental error what's happened since there's no blocking all the variation due to blocking is now combined into experimental error it's huge and because it's huge I can't really see difference between the treatments now let's go take a look at the original analysis okay. notice that the block accounted for the sum of squares 197 or so and the F ratio is greater than 9 remember I said if the F ratio is 1 or greater leave the blocking factor in because it's explaining substantial variation and will give you more precise estimates of the factors in fact take a look at the standard errors of the treatment effects 1.34 now let's take a look to the right when we take the block factor out of the model so now all the blocking variation has been added with experimental error so the experimental error is now balloons to 305 and then look at the standard errors so the uncertainty in our estimates of the treatment effects it went from 1.34 to about 2.1 a substantial increase so that's why in this case I would not remove the block factor it's explaining a lot of variation and we can actually tell that by the magnitude of the F ratio don't look at the p-value it's greater than 1 that says if I take the block out of the model I will indeed increase the standard errors of the treatment effects meaning I'll have a hard time telling if there are differences okay so that's a simple rule to explain okay, differences um, between the term uh, the blocking term in the model and the blocking term out of the model so one last thing I wanted to do in fact I'll use jump to do this is explain how to set up a blocking design with one factor in jump okay. and the easiest way to do that is go to the DOE menu select custom design we, we're going to use this more later in the course I'm going to add one factor and I'm going to call it categorical okay, with six levels so let's just call them uh, let's call this okay factor my experimental factor and let's just call them a b c d e and f now I'm going to add one other factor and custom design allows you to estimate different uh, types of effects so I'm going to pick blocking but I want complete blocks so I want each block to have six runs in it so I'm going to call this second fact factor block that's the blocking factor don't worry jump will figure out how to assign the different treatments to the blocks so we're actually simulating the wheat yield experiment so I have an experimental factor
six levels and I want to add blocking and I want each block to have a complete set of six trials. Click continue. So there's my simple model. Remember there can be no interaction of block and factor. And remember in the experiment they had four blocks so I want 24 trials. So a small amount of arithmetic, nothing very challenging. Click Make Design, okay, and make the table. So there are our four blocks, and each block has a complete set of treatments in random order. So use custom design to create simple, completely randomized designs with one factor. Okay, and we'll return to this topic later in the course. And that concludes our discussion on blocking. Do read through the notes. I skipped a few things, but I did highlight uh, the important uh, concepts and ideas in the notes.